Hello, my name is Dr. Venditti, and this is Ryan Long, and we're at uh, the Sunoco uh, Paper Recycling Facility in Hartsville, South Carolina. Um, uh, what we're going to do today is do a brief walkthrough and uh, tour of the uh, Paper Recycling Facility, describing some of the major operations and how the system works. Um, Ryan, can you tell me uh, the, uh, how the process starts? Yes, uh, this is the beginning of our process. We obviously have to receive our raw material. Uh, much of the raw material at this facility comes in on loaded vans. Um, we have operators working right now to unload these trucks with their forklifts. Um, Ryan, can you tell me a little bit about how many truckloads come in and uh, what kinds of paper comes into the facility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, generally, we're going to unload you know, roughly around 30, possibly 35 trucks a day depending on the volumes of the trucks and, and the types of materials coming in and what we need from our other inventories. We do have an in-house inventory. The materials that we receive is, uh, is generally OCC, old corrugated containers, your cardboard. Uh, we also receive mixed papers, which is a combination of a mix, uh, which would be uh, magazines, newspaper, white paper, some brown paper. Uh, and there's also some other fibers that we, we receive here, tube scrap, which is old tubes and cores that have been bailed up. Uh, we receive some paper we call hard pack, which is generally a cardboard that comes from Asia, has a little bit less fiber strength, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a few other smaller grades that we'll receive, but those, those four grades re represent the vast majority of the fiber we're going to recycle here. Well, so, approximately how far away does the material come from? Uh, the material comes from all over the southeast. Um, in general, the sourcing you don't like to go too much further than a few hours away due to the freight cost, but uh, materials here can be coming from all the way to the coast, uh, whether it be Myrtle Beach and on up to Wilmington, um, north up to as far as Raleigh in that area, um, heading down here to South Carolina, and, uh, and then further south down as far as uh, you know Charleston, that type of area coming back. So approximately about a 200 mile radius. Yeah, that's probably like that's that. probably a decent probably a decent 200 mile radius is probably a decent, and it all depends on your pricing. So. Okay. Right. And what kind of uh, sources? Where does this paper come from? Uh, all kinds of. It can come from small mom and pop recyclers. It can come from our larger commercial facilities. It can come from what we call our MRFs, our material recovery facilities, which are generally the facil facilities recycling the curbside type programs from cities and counties. Um, but uh, Sunoco sources it from internal sources, but also sources it from external sources. And uh, this is a pretty busy area. This is a, a pretty. Uh, Area. Yes. Can you explain some of the issues about safety here? Yes. Um, Sunoco is very particular in, in terms of our pedestrian forklift interaction. Uh, we try to keep make sure our pedestrians are staying at least five feet away from the forklifts at all times. Um, that drivers are using care when they exit, looking to where they're driving. Um, with with paper bales, there's a lot of weight involved. If a bale happened to fall, um, you know the potential for serious injury does exist. So. Um, we're obviously wearing high visibility clothing. That's that's so that the operators see us clearly, and uh, you know, really, we try to limit the pedestrian traffic in this sort of area. But um, for these shots, okay. you know, we're here. Great. All right, Ryan. Let's go ahead and see where the bales are stored in the next process. Okay. Okay. I think we're we're in the inventory warehouse area, and um, uh, Ryan, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, your how you uh, have your inventory? Yeah, this is our material storage pad out here. Um, there's not, not too much fiber on hand right now, but in general, we store all of our different grades, our OCC, our mixed paper, our tube scrap, um, DKL, which is double line cuttings, um, and some, some specialty grades. Um, for the most part, we try to keep a strategic inventory just in case we have issues with trucking and whatnot, and so this kind of serves as an extra area to store. Some of the materials fed directly from trucks onto conveyors, but uh, in general, it's not rocket science, it's just, uh, just a storage area for bales. So how much storage do you have? How many days of capacity do you try to average um, in here? Well, right now we're not averaging much. Um, we have probably much less than a few hours of, of storage here. Um, but when this pad is full, it can carry at least a day's worth of storage. And we have another downstairs area that can store an additional day's worth of storage. So this, is, uh, this storage is outdoors. Um, is that concern you at all? Uh, the only concern really would be, uh, it, you know, if, if you have a, a sitting out here long, it can age. Uh, so it is important to try to flip your inventory some, which is probably what they're trying to do right now is flip the inventory. Um, if the inventory sits out too long and it rains, uh, the fiber the fiber can just start to degrade. Um, but for the most part, it's not a not a huge concern having it out outdoor storage for this type of material. Okay. Um, uh, 
There's a certain kind of OCC. There's OCC and then there's Asian OCC. Can you tell us, do you keep those separate and what's yeah. the difference between those two? Yes, um, yeah, what the, the, the Asian OCC is commonly preferred as, a, as hard pack and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit softer color, a little less brown color is, is generally the easiest way to tell what you've got. And the reason uh, we actually se segregate those two is because of the fiber quality. Um, generally the fiber quality in a hard pack bale or an Asian bale is going to be a shorter quality so you're not going to make a strong of a paper out of it versus your, your, your higher grade OCC that you're actually were paying a little bit more of a premium for. Okay. The one issue with storing outside would be if you had a high value white grade. Uh, in general, we don't store these outside. We try to store them where they're out of cover because there are some recycled paper grades that sell for several hundred tons, uh, t uh, several hundred dollars per ton or more that uh, if we do happen to have those on site, we try to keep them out of the weather element so that they don't age or degrade and we try to keep them in a more of a, uh, I guess, controlled environment. Okay, Ryan, can you tell us where we are in our process right now? Yes, we're at the beginning of one of our pulpers. Uh, this is our number five pulper. Uh, it's currently running OCC, uh, but right now we're going to mixed paper, making a great change. Uh, mixed paper is our paper, again, it's a combination of newspapers, magazines, some cardboard, uh, newsprint. The uh, primary advantage of newsprint, I mean, mixed paper is that it's cheaper. It does provide us a shorter fiber in the process, which gives us different properties in our paper. But uh, generally, we run a lot of mixed paper uh, simply for cost reasons, because it's cheaper than our cardboard. So how many tons approximately go into a pulper batch? Um, it depends on which pulp you're, you're, you're talking about. Um, these pulpers are continuous pulpers throughout the day. Uh, the pulper like this may be running potentially 60, 70, 80 tons a day, um, where some of our pulpers can run much more, 200, 300 tons a day. So what's the typical weight of a bale? Um, a bale right here, uh, this bale, looking at the bale shape and whatnot, is probably close to 2,000 pound bale, uh, possibly a little bit less than that. But uh, generally it packs well, makes a good, good solid density bale. Right, one of the disadvantages of mixed paper is the actual contamination load. Um, a lot of this comes from curbside recycling now where they, or folks are allowed to co-mingle the material together. So you'll find a yogurt container and a, and a drink bottle and you know, random plastics mixed in there. And all of that is not anything we want in our paper making process, obviously, but we have methods to screen that out, which we'll see here shortly. All right, Ryan, can you tell us how you feed the pulpers and uh, how you measure how much is going into the pulper? Well, um, essentially the main thing that the operator is going to do as he's running his pulper is, is kind of watch his consistencies, uh, make sure that the pulp, you know, the, the stock and water ratio is coming out of the right, 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 right amount. If uh, if he's getting a little bit light on consistency, he might add a little more stock to heavy it up in the pulper, um, and vice versa, he might take stock out if he's getting a little heavy coming out of the pulper. So, is there an online consistency measurement? Yes, there's an online consistency measurement um, coming out of the pulper as it feeds into our uh, feeds into our screens um, as we begin our screening process, so that he's got visibility to what's happening inside of this pulper tub. Okay. Um, uh, the the pulpers are they batch or are they continuous? It's a continuous pulper. Um, as it runs, it, it's it's as it's feeding material in, it's drawing material out from the bottom um, through what are called extraction plates, which are which are plates with holes in them. Uh, fairly large holes, so some contamination will make it through those holes as well, but that's just part of the process as we begin the screening process. Okay, and is there a certain blend of materials that go into each pulper? How do you know what types of materials go into what pulper? Uh, generally, that's going to be dictated by what kind of grades are running on the paper machine, but uh, in, this, in this current operation, for most of our pulpers, we have kind of a set blend. Um, off of off of the pulper. So on this on this uh, this pulper in particular, we call our number 12 pulper. Uh, we we generally are running a, a combination of mainly OCC, where, where we mix in some tube scrap and cone scrap, and uh, and then also some mixed paper in order to uh, lessen our fiber cost. All right, let's go look at the pulpers. All right, let's do that. All right, um, we're right here near the pulper, and um, uh, Ryan, can you just kind of tell us some of the important operations that are going on within the pulper now? Absolutely. Uh, so here's our, uh, our number 12 pulper. It's a 20 foot pulper. Uh, currently, what's basically going on is you have a uh, really a blender type operation, if you want to call it that. It's the simplest way to speak it. As the fiber falls into the tub, we're adding in water. Uh, we're adding in some recirculation from some of the screens, some of the other uh, rejects. And you see a, a rag coming out. The rag tail is actually helping remove a lot of the, the wire and whatnot, uh, tape, anything long that can string up on that tail. Um, but really, you're just trying to create turbulence so you can start breaking some of those H, H bonds inside the fiber. Um, not 
a whole lot of sign, you know, a whole lot of rocket science here. Okay. But uh, this is, you know, really where the recycling starts to really begin. Okay. Now, what consistency is this pulver at, approximately? Um, without looking at the, without looking at the actual DCS system, I'm, a, I'm assuming he's probably running at around three and a half to four percent consistency now. Uh, we'll dilute that down we're running through our stock pumps as we feed it to screens. But uh, just kind of an eyeball test on that. Okay. I see a basketball and a football in there, a lot of uh, junks and things like that. How eventually do these things get out of the pulper? Um, a lot of the, the contaminants that float and can't be strung up necessarily on the ragger and won't necessarily make it through the pulper as the as most of this material is exiting through the bottom of the pulper as more comes in. The stuff that floats on the top, um, what we have to do occasionally is actually shut the pulper down and dump the entire batch out. And that's when you actually lose that material. Now, when we do that, we actually run it down as low as we can to save as much fiber as we can. And then at the very end, we fill it back with water and we dump that back out. And that's where those rejects will leave the system. Okay, so I also see the ragger, which has all the wire and plastic spinning around. And it actually doesn't look like it's moving, but how quickly does it be pulled out? And what uh, happens to that stuff? The ragger is actually, we, 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 there is a way to automate it so that it pulls out on a time cycle. The, the way we currently do it is, as our operators are basically in charge of pulling it out and, and just it's kind of a gut feel thing. Okay. Um, making paper, especially in our process, is still a little bit of an art. It requires some skill and experience to be able to do it correctly. And with our rag tail here, they'll actually will pull it out as they feel like it's time to pull it out. And they usually can get a good idea. They don't want to get too wide because it can break. You don't want to pull it when it's too thin because then it'll break as well. Okay. So you have to be very careful and it really takes a, takes a little bit of experience to do it correctly. All right. So the um at the bottom of the pulper, you've got a rotor that's spinning around and that's slushing up and slurrying the fibers. Correct. And then there's a, uh, a plate with holes or slot holes on the bottom and that accepts the good fibers, is that Yes, true? there's an extraction plate that sits below the rotor in this in this pulper and as it spins, the fiber and other any other contaminants and materials that fit through those holes physically will make its, will make its way through those holes and be carried forward in the process. Okay. So uh, how big is this pulper? What diameter is this? This is, this is a 20-foot uh, uh, black Clawson hydro pulp. Okay. okay, well after the pulper leaves the pulper, what other operations do you have to clean? Well, what we'll do is a, uh, after it leaves the pulper, it goes to a chest, but then it's pumped to these, what we call high-density cyclones. Uh, and these essentially work to spin the, spin the stock or the slurry inside the chamber. And when it does, heavy contaminants will work its way to the sides and by gravity work its way down while the, st the stock on the inside or the access that you want will go out through the top. And uh, as the stock runs its way down, it's, it's captured in a chamber down here that we can dump on a basically a sporadic and manual basis. Um, it, it's generally, they'll dump on a, uh, a, a set schedule, what the gentlemen do. And so what you're gonna get and what you're gonna recover is just a lot of staples, um, other metal, glass is typically, you hope to capture as much glass as you can here. Um, nuts but and bolts. Nuts and bolts, um, pieces of aluminum, anything like that, that just in general have a higher density and will, by centrifugal force, move to the outside of the cyclone wall. Very important process, because without these cyclone cleaners, your, your cleaners down the line will not, will not function and also be torn up very quickly by this material entering their screen. Okay, uh, Ryan, what's the next step after the cyclone is made? Um, the stock is received from the cyclones, the access goes into a stock chest, pumped upstairs here to our UV400 screen. Um, and essentially how the screen works, the stock enters in the bottom of the screen. There's a basket inside that actually will allow good fiber to work its way through and contaminants, you know, more fiber that's too large will work its way up the screen. So as fiber works its way through the basket and is accepted, it works its way through the screen basket onto and it goes forward in the process and it's almost ready for the paper sheet. The rejected process goes up and out of the screen basket and then works its way towards the tank where we go to our secondary screen process. Okay. Um, uh, what kind of, uh, what does the basket have? Does it have holes or slots? It is a slotted basket. Um, we actually, uh, we use a uh, wire screen basket and uh, generally uh, 
the, the it's about 16 thousandths millimeter is what we're is what we're shooting for on these baskets. But they vary depending on the fiber quality. The greater the basket opening, the more fiber you will get, but the more contaminants you will get. The smaller the basket opening, the less fiber and the more rejects you will get. So it's a it's a it's a trade-off. You gotta weigh it with your the machine quality and basically the paper quality you're trying to make versus the production you expect to get off your screen. And I imagine there's a rotor inside the basket. Yes, right? that's correct. Inside the basket you have a rotor that's set a very set set point from the basket, very close, but you don't want it to be too tight because you could basically wind your screen over, but you don't want it to be too too far back and then you lose your screening efficiency. So, but yes, there's a rotor that sits inside. It's basically the same size as the basket. It has foils on the outside, and as it spins, it helps orient the fiber and basically drive the fiber through the screen basket. All right, uh, Ryan, we saw that there was a lot of fiber in the screen rejects. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how you might capture some of that fiber from the screen rejects? Absolutely. What, uh, what we do in our, in our process here is we, we'll send it to a secondary pulping device. This is called our float purger, and uh, essentially this is like a mini pulper enclosed. It uh, has a, has a uh, rotor on the bottom and extraction plates, so as the rotor turns, it's re-pulping that material, uh, getting back into a more of a slurry form. It's quite thick as it comes out as a reject. Um, the accepts are then fed back forward uh, to potentially a third screen, uh, and the rejects are sent out the top. This is usually your lightweight type materials, and that's then sent to the landfill. So these are our ultra sorters. Uh, the rejects from our float purger that we just saw will be sent to these ultra sorters. And this is again to recover fiber from the reject stream. Um, I'm gonna pop this door here, doctor. And you'll see what's happening here as the fiber is entering the chamber and it's being diluted and the good fiber is making its way out of the screen. Sometimes you get styrofoam coming through, but your plastics will work their way down the screen and go out the back end to our screw compactor. Okay, what are, what are these, uh, Ryan? These are our side hill thickeners. Um, essentially, what the, the purpose of these is when the stock goes through the screening process, we have to dilute it down to a lower consistency so that you can, you can basically screen more efficiently. Um, and what we do here is we're actually thickening the stock up. We're going to take water back out of the stock so that it's heavier headed to the paper machine. Um, very critical part of the process. The machines demand stock at a certain consistency. And so we've got to thicken it up somehow. And this is what we do here. So really, this is the final product of our stock prep operation. And this is going to go to the paper machine. If there's a problem with it here, then the paper machine will have a problem with it on their, on their side. So, but you can see from what we saw earlier in the process, where we had coming out of um, uh, our cyclones and whatnot, we now have a, a good fiber. Okay, and what do you do with all the water? So in this side hill screen, basically you, you're thickening the fiber up and a lot of water is actually going through the slots in this screen. Where does that water go? That water, that water is, is recaptured as uh, dirty white water and we use, reuse that in our process. So in the pulping process, you saw us adding water to the pulpers. Well, that's where this will be added because there is gonna be fiber lost in this process. Fiber is certainly gonna make its way through these little, these little slots right here that are hard to see. But when those slots get, when that water makes it, you know, that fiber makes it through those slots, we can recapture that by sending it back through the pulping process. Yeah, so Brian, what do we have here? Uh, this is what we call our rotor strainer. Um, in the, at the bottom of a process, really, literally the bottom of a process, we actually dump our pulpers to get a lot of the trash out. Well, what happens is that water and other materials that are dumped out of the process, they, they can get into our sewer system or into our water system. Well, what we do with here is we pump our water up and the water runs through this rotor strainer. It actually takes out a lot of the large contaminants and then the reject material makes its way off the side and then goes out to be uh, combined with our screw compactor and then burned in our boiler. Okay, so this kind of cleans up the water so you can reuse it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's, 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 that's the main purpose of it, to take out a lot of this contamination that we do not want with water. And part of the rotor strainer is any long, small fibers can be recovered here and then reused, obviously, throughout the process. So the liberated, the small individual fibers go with the water back to the pulp or wherever you're going to use the water. Yes. That is correct. It's always a challenge to get all the rejects out of the system, so you gotta be, uh, you gotta work on your water just as well as your pole. Yep. If you keep recirculating dirty water and contaminants keep, keep accumulating, then you're gonna have your water's gonna be so dirty that you're not gonna be able to remove it. 
Absolutely, you're going to jam lines, or you're not going to be able to Absolutely. operate a lot of the equipment that you need to operate. So, important piece of equipment for us. And the plastic kind of falls on the outside and it goes down into a screw conveyor. Yep. That sends it out outside to the plastic piles. That's that's correct. And then it'll, then it'll, from there it'll be burned in a boiler. All right. Hey, let's go on. Hey Ryan, what are we looking at right here? Um, this is basically again the end of our process um, after the rejects have pretty much gone through all their screening. Um, you can see a much higher concentration of the plastics and styrofoam versus the fiber here. Um, depending on what time, you know, what, what, what part of the operation you're in and really what kind of fiber you're running, you'll see more or less of the brown fiber. Uh, sometimes you get some wet strength and that won't beat up well and, and will become part of this process. But um, in general, this is the end, and uh, this material here will go out to the uh, the boiler to be burned. So, because okay. um, this is still has good fuel value, um, the, the plastics certainly have good fuel value. And while, while we rather to capture as much of that fiber as we can, um, trying to rescreen this another another stage becomes uh, uneconomical. Okay. And this is a compactor right here. Yes, right? and this is actually it's a screw compactor. So it's, it's screwing, and, and basically what it's doing is trying to dewater as much. Uh, as much as it can on the rejects so that they're as dry as they can be going into the boiler. So we obviously don't want to have to, we don't want to have to cook out all that moisture if we don't have to. Right. This runs continuously? Or? Yes, it runs continuously all throughout the day. It'll just sit there push, pushing out slug after slug after slug. Okay. So it'll fill up a 30 yard container roughly at one time per shift, so three times per day. So in the whole process, how much, uh, what percentage do you think approximately are rejects? Um, really, what we call our shrinkage in this operation is uh, we generally lose about 10% of the total fiber we bring in. Yeah. Um, it's lost in, in, in basically this method or what we call pulper dumps when we have to dump out the pulper to get the other, other trash out or the ragtail, things that we've seen earlier in the process. So roughly um, out of every 10 tons that we bring in to make paper out of, We'll, we'll generate nine tons of paper um, off the off of the paper machine. Okay. All right. So we're now we're at the really what's the end of the process, at least the reject screen process of our uh, of our, our recycling. Uh, you see the large pile down here. This is coming from our our really multiple pulpers that we have operating, and uh, kind of the the dark side of the recycling. But nonetheless, this is the. Uh, the, the things that we can outrun. Um, the materials you see down here, uh, we'll dewater them and try to burn as many, much of it as we can. Um, depending on how much metal and whatnot is in the reject stream, it may have to go to a landfill, but most of this we try to burn as fuel so that we uh, still recover some value out of this, this part of the process. So our fibers now at this point have been um, cleaned and screened. A lot of the contaminants are out of there. Um, we just thickened it up with the side hill washer, and now the next thing I guess is to prepare those fibers for the paper machine. Can you explain to us what the preparation involves? Absolutely. Um, so what we'll do in this in this operation is uh, we, we we might blend our fiber. Um, so we have fiber coming from one pulper and some fibers coming from another pulper, depending on what kind of strength properties and, and smoothness properties we're trying to generate. But uh, the next step is really to refine the fiber and refine the pulp. And that is to, if we have a 500 or so for instance, we might try to achieve you know, a couple hundred point drop just to uh, create more bonding sites on the fiber so that we can, we can add strength to our, to our sheet. Okay, so in the mechanical refining process, you're using a metal disc that, with teeth on it and you're rubbing those fibers and you're basically bruising them and making them more flexible, allowing more water to soak into the wall. Uh, getting some fibrils. You're also doing a little bit of cutting, which is not so good with recycled fiber. That's correct. And this is all going to help the strength of your material. Right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, again, you can always over refine and you can always under refine. Okay. So it's, it's definitely a delicate balance to make sure you're putting in the right amount of refining into the into the fiber. And one way that you can help control your refining is by helping to control the quality of the stock coming to it. So if we're seeing large fluctuations in the quality of our stock where we have a lot of good cardboard and then we wind it with a lot of short mixed type fibers, then it can obviously you can wind up over refining very quickly on your refiners. So it's important to for our for our, our gentlemen that run our refiners to be keeping a close eye on what their apprentices are doing. Okay. 
So can your operators of the paper machine, can they tell if you've over refines? They usually can, they'll usually start to tell um, as it gets towards the end of the machine, they start to do some of the some of the testing, but sometimes they can tell in the way the fiber is draining on the all running across the wire. So if, it, if it's not draining correctly, they can say, okay, well, I maybe need to back off on my refining, or they can get a call from the, what we call a dry end of the machine, where they might say, hey, the tests are not showing up like they should. Maybe we should increase the refining or possibly increase the fiber strength, potentially add chemicals. Okay, well, why don't we go take a look at the refiners? Okay. Yeah, we sure do. I mean, it, it can vary day to day. You can have good days and bad days, but 
Uh, there's a lot of variables that can affect your whining uh, from the from the tension in the paper and making what they call a soft roll. Uh, your knife blades in the back that are cutting the sheet, they can be dull and, and you don't get good cuts and the rolls don't come up front right. Uh, you can have paper breaks where it actually holes in the sheet or something, it hits a winder blade and causes it to, to, to shoot the paper apart. So, so there's a lot of different issues that can happen. It's a very, very precise uh, operation going on here. A lot of different with, with moving parts that have to be moving in sync for the things to operate correctly here. So very critical part of our process. If it doesn't run well, we don't make a good finished product. So after the rolls are made off the paper machine and then they're brought over to here, where, what are we doing here with the rolls? Uh, this is our warehousing and storage facility. Um, as you can see behind us and, uh, and, and really all around us, um, we have our rolls and they're stacked and pretty much they're ready to be shipped to our customers. Okay, and how do they get shipped to the customers? What um, usually by truck. We can send some stuff by rail. Um, we really don't uh, use much rail car as, as you know we did in the past, but so everything you're seeing right here is going to be shipped by a domestic truck. Okay. And um, what conditions do you have around here um, to keep the paper in good shape? Uh, well, we don't do any conditioning of the uh, just the area. Mainly, what you know what we're going to be concerned about is making sure you got a roof overhead so the uh, so that your board can't get wet, um, and and really making sure our forklift truck drivers take care to not damage the outer sides of the you know, damage the shrink wrap or damage the outer wrap of the rolls. So um, really not, not too complex for us when it comes to uh, warehousing. All right. Thanks, Ryan, for the nice tour. Um, you've got a very interesting facility, and we appreciate you having us. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate you guys coming and visiting Sunoco. Um, we hope you all enjoyed the tour and uh, learned a lot about our process. We sure did. Thank you. <laughs>